Okay, well, thank you very much, Benjamin, for your presentation. Uh, we're now going to do a short presentation on the paper and then introduce some like uh, discussion. We want to address one thing before anything. Uh, since this is a working paper, the version we worked on is a previous version to the one Professor Brown presented. So we will talk about something that he did not, and he talked about things that we're not going to talk about for obvious reasons. Sorry but about that. <laughs> Mostly, it's the same topic yeah. and the same stuff. So, uh, to begin with, uh, there will be like yeah the introduction, and uh, then we will go for the discussion. So we think that it's important to start talking about Hirschman's uh, child exit and voice to like really fully understand what's this um, change of regime from uh, how it used to work with pension funds to what it is with asset management and asset capitalism. Uh, so Hirschman in the 70s basically proposed that members of our organization, in order to change the organization, to push for changes, have two main uh, ways, exit or voice. By exit is withdrawing from this relationship, whereas voice is trying to actually change the organization from within. This applies to companies, but it can also apply to for example, uh, citizens, so citizens can actually exit the country migrating or can actually voice voting uh, to employees. They can quit the company or they can do a strike. Or for example, consumers, we can decide to go shopping elsewhere or we can actually ask to talk to the manager. So it applies to basically every social interaction in terms of community. And uh, Hirschman also added like a third layer, which is loyalty. So when loyalty like enters into the equation, this exit voice uh, cost benefit analysis can change because our um, like if we are loyal to the company, maybe we will not say that much and we will not exit in order not to threat the system. But that's how it used to be in the past because now under asset manager capitalism, which is uh, Brown's proposal, because these big asset managers have so much they own such a fully diversified universal portfolio, they don't really need to like threat governments or countries or other companies to exit because they just control them. So this triad, this Hirschman triad, is no longer valid under this asset manager capitalism regime. And as a consequence, uh, first of all, um, they, yeah, they own a significant amount of equity, so it doesn't, it's not valid anymore. But on the other hand, the other side of the coin, according to Brown, is that uh, these asset managers face political liability in the sense that they are like very highly exposed to, um, to the opinion, to the public opinion, to governments, to political parties. They can get attacked from the left, from the right. So uh, under this situation, what we have is that before, to sum up, there was the shareholder primacy regime in which efficiency was gained through exit and boards, whereas now in asset manager capitalism, basically uh, you don't really need any more of this and you have unnecessarily loyalty in the sense that you just own everything. And uh, Brown also says that this combination of control and philosophication is an accidental feature of uh, owning that many equities and that the political liability is a cost to the companies, we will contest that a bit uh, after. So uh, basically the conclusions of the paper are that uh, firstly, there is this idea of like the stewardship hypothesis So because these asset managers own so much, they have actually the power to push for the ecological transition or to push investors to invest in less fossil fuel decarbonization and sustainable energies, for example, but they're not doing it. There is like a lot of evidence that shows that they're not doing it and therefore uh, they are actually not using their power to uh, push for environmental and social corporate ECH uh, principles. Then that uh, the main determinants of the profits from these companies are first of all competition. They compete for owning as many assets as possible but because they do it through indices as he was saying, it doesn't really matter which is the company they're investing because they just follow the most, the highest ranking companies in this indices. And uh, they will also push for uh, regulation, for changes. They will lobby to change 
the uh, macroeconomic and regulatory policy. And lastly, which is something that it's not in the newest version of the paper, uh, it's addressed as organizational hypocrisy in the sense that these companies will do some sort of a greenwashing, so they we will talk and they will say that they can do this and they can do that, but in the end, as we've seen, they don't. They just don't really, especially in the US, they don't really push for changes. And uh, yeah, so that's basically the summary of the paper. Uh, now, Lucas will explain the second part of the presentation. Yes, um, so I will now um, have the uh, pleasure of explaining the second part of our presentation to you which is more of a uh, creative way to do this. So we want to do a very uh, structured and like, um, not a detailing, but dynamic debate. So what we thought about is that we uh, create a scenario. So we have the following scenario that we are now um, in a press conference. So all of you, you're like journalists, expert, whatever you want to feel like. And we have a couple of discussions here. And then we will have four uh, short rounds of discussions to keep it very structured and keep it moving. So, I can introduce our discussions for today. We have a, a representative of the EU and thereby regulation with Professor Brown. Um, then we have a representative and head of BlackRock France, Mathieu. And we have a representative of the middle class who has uh, assets in uh, pension funds in the yellow shirt. Joaquin, and I will act as a journalist and a bit trying to moderate the debate a little bit. So how will the debate work? Um, we have a short presentation of BlackRock in the beginning to give some more context, and then we will have four rounds of questions. Uh, the topics of the questions are um, similar to the fields of possible future uh, research Professor Brown mentioned in his paper. Um, so we will give a, sh uh, a short input in the beginning, only maybe two minutes, each of us, or twice, for the different topics, like a very short input and pose a question to Professor Brown. Then he will give a short answer. We want to keep this around five minutes, and then there will be two questions for the audience and then another reply from Professor Brown. Is that understandable for everybody, more or less? Okay, <coughs> very good. And like... Uh, one more thing I want to address is like, as you probably see, we are all male panel and we're very for sorry for that. And as a result of that, I will try to prioritize questions from female speakers in the discussion to balance this out as good as we can. Thank you very much. So now we can continue with our presentation of Blackboard. Hello everyone. Uh, first, I would like to thank you, the organizer, to invite me for this conference. Uh, I'm Jean-Francois Cyrilli. I'm the head of uh, BlackRock France, Luxembourg and Belgium. And it's a pleasure to be here. I will try to like, banish some cliché you probably have on BlackRock and our activity. So BlackRock is a company which was created in 1988. And from this time, we really have a new strategy, financial strategy we brought into the market, which I will detail a bit further after that. We are a multinational investment company, and we, are in, we have almost 70 offices in 30 countries, and we have almost 20,000 employees in, in our company. So we are the, world, the world's largest asset manager, and when I said asset manager, it's not our money, it's, it's our client money. And we have something like $10 trillion uh, in asset under management in, in January 2022. And we have a really diverse portfolio and cli clients. The main, the main financial product we have is ETF, which is a financial product uh, based on stock market index, which means that it's a super diverse product with a very low risk. We have a different client, such, such as hedge funds, pension funds, but most of them are individuals just like you. And we really want to go from a short-termism short approach of, of the finance to towards a long-termism approach for the finance within a resilient capitalism and responsible capitalism. And I'm sure here there will probably be some people who want to invest or put their savings into our company. I mean, it's easy, super easy to do this. You just have to ask your bankers and we're gonna have super low fees. We, we are the lowest, uh, the, the lowest fees uh, in terms of intellect, intellectual services. And we're gonna help you to invest in the more resilient and the more responsible uh, investment you want. Thank you.
Yes. One thing I forgot to mention before, all of these statements are from actual level of communication. <laughs> um, yes. So, our first topic, and I will try to keep track of the time. Yes. Um, so, asset manager capitalism as a, a corporate governance regime. And I really want to focus here on the role of ETFs. And also, this is like also going into my question. Um, also, in the, re the report on uh, financial stability by the Banque de, Banque de France, uh, Larry Summer, also the head of the CEO of BlackRock, also emphasized the importance of ETFs um, in the rise of the um, uh, of the in the rise of asset managers. Uh, so my question is more on the importance of ETS compared um, to uh, the importance of uh, asset managers in the changes we see in corporate governance of the financial market. Because especially when we talk about the possibility of an exit strategy, um, this is strongly also connected to the ETFs and not only to like who owns them or who manages them. So I wanted to ask this because in your paper there is a strong focus on the asset managers but not on the financial uh, tools. And thereby also, would there be a future you see where the financial products stay the same, but maybe the people managing or the structure of the financial market changes, but still with uh, um, uh, the same importance of ETFs and how this would um, impact uh, the, the um, corporate governance of uh, companies and the general financial market. And one further thing on ETFs, um, also, uh, how uh, BlackRock and Vanguard often argue that it's only a stabilizing factor and it's because it's so diversified, it's very stable. But if we look at some new papers like the literature review of um, Luca and Levy, they also point out that there is like some concerns regarding a higher uh, fluctuation um, in asset prices due to um, fundamentally incomplete information with these uh, very complex uh, products um, as well as an increased risk for uh, financial bubbles. All right. Uh, well, first of all, thank you for this uh, very you know, serious engagement uh, with, with this stuff. Should I go over there because of the microphone? Oh, no, yeah, there's one there. Yeah. Yeah. Um, which I really appreciate, and uh, yeah, I'm BlackRock was very convincing, I think. <laughs> I'm willing to, uh, I'm willing to, s uh, I'll send my money. <laughs> um, so the question about uh, the role of uh, ETFs as a financial product and technology um, that is potentially independent, right, of yes. the actors is a very good one. And um, I must say, I came myself to this topic uh, via uh, by being interested in ETFs, uh, and so I published this paper in 2016, uh, which uh, well then I was still mostly working on central banks only, uh, and that was my only non-central bank paper at the time. And I was <coughs> really uh, fascinated by the question why it took so long for index um, funds of which ETFs are basically one category, to take over asset management, uh, which really uh, is a fascinating question because literally uh, the fact that fund <coughs> managers on average cannot outperform the stock market because fund managers are the stock market, it has been established since the 1970s. And, uh, uh, I think Meckling, no, who is it? Jensen. Um, Jensen wrote his yeah. PhD on this in '67. Uh, so uh, it's it's a very old story. Sam Paul Samuelson was on the record in the '70s arguing that uh, pension funds uh, should only invest in in index funds because they're cheap. You don't have to pay exorbitant salaries to fund managers, whose only function is to sometimes be on the winning side and sometimes be on the losing side because that's how the market must work. Um, and so I, I, uh, my entry point to this entire topic is that ETFs are a great thing. Uh, and that it's good uh, that uh, you know, there is a, a product where 
basically um, pension funds and individual investors can participate basically in economic growth because ultimately in the long term uh, that's what uh, a share in a diversified equity portfolio gives you is a share in, in basically economic growth. Um, even though in the shorter term there are massive fluctuations and there can be long bubbles where the stock market rises faster than the economy grows or falls uh, while the economy grows. Um, so that's good. Um, on the other hand, uh, it is very important to keep in mind with this question that stock ownership is extremely unequally distributed. And the vehicle via which people invest in this asset class is um, cannot change anything about that. So in the US, and I didn't have the time anymore to show you this, the top 1% of the wealth distribution own 90% of the corporate equity and mutual fund shares that invest in corporate equity. Um, the bottom 50% nothing. The rest is the remaining 40%. Uh, and then uh, if you include retirement assets, which is separate in the distribution of financial accounts in the US, retirement assets being you know, your uh, shares in a pension fund, basically, then there it's slightly more e equally distributed. Um, uh, but still, the bottom 50% have nothing. Mm -hmm. So you can have you know, the cheapest ETFs, uh, but you cannot fix this problem. Thank okay. You. Okay. So now we have time for uh, two questions, please. Questions on the topic, on the topic of like ETFs, too big to fail theory, uh, distribution of uh, funds, maybe something in that direction. Yes, please. I still don't fully understand the connection between the rising relevance of indexes and the decreasing role of exit as a structural power. Um, so I wonder, is it because companies like BlackRock decide to invest or to mirror these indexes, or is it due to a technical reason that they cannot exit? Are those, like, are those um, provided yet by someone else? these indexes in which then BlackRock itself is investing? Or what is the reason? So is it like that they are actually losing the structural power, or is it that they're just not exercising it? Do we have a second question? OK, I think this is a very relevant one. So it's a very, take some more very excellent question. Thank you. Um, I'll try to be brief. Um, so. I would say there are two reasons. One is the index producers are separate companies, like S&P um, or MSCI uh, are the most uh, powerful ones. And so the S&P 500 is an index provided by the S&P. The MSCI world is the most used worldwide stock index. And um, so there's no reason necessary, no function, no technical reason why BlackRock could not, you know, define these indices itself. It's, I think, more of a, they, they like the fact that this is a separate uh, company that does this. And so they, uh, and these asset managers all just replicate the same indices. Um, the fact that they then uh, do not buy or sell individual companies is, is, in theory, you could imagine an uh, index fund where BlackRock retains the possibility, you know, just in, in the small print of the fund. We replicate this index unless, for some reason, we believe that this company should really be not, not be now portfolio. Legally, they could, mm -hmm. I'm sure, create such a fund. But it doesn't make sense, I think, because then they would be an active fund again. And active funds require fund managers, and fund managers make a lot of money and then you have to pay them uh, and then your f your cost to the investor would be closer to an active fund and then you might as well be an active fund. So I think it's more this, um, you replicate an index that exists, that's the model, and the theoretical possibility of having what you say uh, could, I agree with you, it could be done, but economically probably doesn't make much sense. 
it's interesting. Thanks. Thank you very much. Okay, so we can now continue with the second topic. All right. I, I, I have a question about inequality. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. Can we see? It, can we imagine that uh, these funds will evolve over time to become, say, market makers, provide financial services, and uh, uh, as a result, engulf a larger part of the financial sector because BlackRock has been offering trading services and a lot of services lately. So can we see them drifting from this simple strategy toward a more globally financial, and as a result, they will present an, a more of an institutional risk because they will actively trade? Yes, um, absolutely. I think we can already uh, observe this. I didn't even talk about this Aladdin software exactly. that uh, BlackRock provides, which uh, is maybe similar to this uh, Amazon, what's it called? Um, the back, the, uh, okay. no, 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 the, Alexa? Uh, hmm? Alexa? Web service. Yeah, the Amazon Web Services. Yeah. Uh, basically a back-end infrastructure for other financial companies that uh, BlackRock provides, a sof software platform. Exactly. Right. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, so that's how they are systemically important. Um, and then, they have moved into private equity, which so far they have not done. Uh, so they be, they are becoming, you know, there's always an incentive for large financial firms and basically uh, to become conglomerates. This has been true for banks. This has been true for these public equity asset managers, and it's also you can see it for private equity firms, which are becoming conglomerates. So there's always there's very a very strong structural push uh, to become too big to fail. I would say. Thank you. Thank you very much. All right, so now I will represent your average middle class household as such. I wake up every morning, I ride my bike to work because I'm committed to the environment. I leave my job at five, I work in the publishing industry in a small uh, publisher. And recently I inherited a house. Therefore, uh, because I saw Jean-François' presentation on a news channel, I said, hey, what can I do with this house? Maybe we, I can make some money out of it. So I contacted BlackRock and I decided that I wanted to make something out of it. Let's see what happens, you know. Let's try to put it on the market. Let's try to, like, uh, use the money to do an investment. Let's use it as uh, insurance for doing other type of investments. And now I have my job, I have my income, but I'm also perceiving rent from investing, from the capital market. So what am I to traditional um, discussion on inequality? Am I a worker or am I an asset owner? Do I represent the working class or do I represent the capital? And this is what this vast, very recent bibliography has been suggesting, some of which are actually like discussing and contesting Piketty's idea that income inequality is the most important one, and actually saying that Yes, but you're missing the wealth inequality, the asset inequality. And actually, Atkins, for example, goes farther and says that inequality is no longer only an employment relationship, but it's also of whether or not you have the capacity to buy assets or not. Because it's no longer as it used to be in the previous regimes, because now the picture is a bit more complex. Nonetheless, as Brown was saying, the top 1% still owns most of the assets. So like this middle class also is like a small portion. It's not everyone, it's not every worker. But nonetheless, it's an interesting discussion to fund, to, to have, sorry. So pension funds. What is happening with pension funds? Because on the one hand, okay, sure. Uh, on the one hand, um, the government, will have the... <laughs> All right. Yeah, I, I'm, not, I'm not even in there anymore. <laughs> I'm going to... Some, some <laughs> the, there's no more. Yes. This. So the question that would be, considering the increasing global financial interdependence, how can the state safeguard the middle class wealth for example, by regionalizing finance, while at the same time assuring the financial sector that the revenues will keep going up 
for example, kicking borders open to capital flows. Mm -hmm. So how to resolve this tension by government, by officials, by uh, politicians, that they have to like both hear the voice of the middle class, of the working class, that they now also an asset manager, an asset owner, and the big capital. And is there room or is there a discussion on asset redistributive policy? Is it happening? Is it even like part of the discussion? And um, yeah, and then why do electorates then keep voting for governments that facilitate concentration of wealth? So like, if you could like go a bit farther on this like complex uh, train. Yes. All right. Uh, yes. Thank you very much. I think the pension fund um, uh, issue is really key uh, to understanding understanding this like broader political economy that is also discussed by these authors, the asset economy, um, Atkins et al. and uh, Truth and Walter, the wealth effect, also Pagliari, the the. the the effect of uh, widespread ownership of financial wealth on the preferences, on the political preferences and voter behavior uh, in, yeah, um, I guess mostly, mostly uh, rich countries be uh, because that's mostly where, you know, this fi financial asset ownership has made inroads into the middle class. Um, even though, yeah, I mean, uh, of course, it's also interesting that uh, one of the pioneers for the financialization of pensions was uh, uh, Chile, uh, very early on under Pinochet. Um, so can you can you can you repeat that, please? Okay. <laughs> um, oh yes. Okay. Um, I already said here. So now um, uh, the issue with. Um, uh, pension funds, I think, is very complicated and structural because, well, well, there is a trap, of course, in turning workers into shareholders, right? Yeah. Because uh, there is a functional distribution of income between labor and capital. And uh, in theory, it sounds like a good idea to say to workers, look, in addition to your income from uh, labor from being workers, uh, you will get a uh, share in the uh, profits that uh, the companies are making. So you will also become a shareholder. So in theory, uh, this is very good. Um, <coughs> but then uh, there is, of course, also costs. Because once you are also a shareholder, maybe then uh, your support for what trade unions have traditionally uh, done, which is to fight for the share of uh, you know, uh, GDP that goes to labor, uh, maybe they become less committed to that. And you can look very closely at how what unions in the US, for example, do, which is a large part of what they, uh, uh, an ever larger part of what they do is to co-manage pension funds. Uh, and what have they done with these pension funds? Well, increasingly, in uh, over the last 20 years, they have shifted an ever larger uh, part of their portfolios to private equity. So they have been investing in the most aggressive uh, and anti-labor, in a sense, uh, um, asset managers that, that exist um, in order to increase the returns for their uh, beneficiaries, the future retirees, the current workers. Um, so there is, uh, I think, yeah. Um, uh, uh, historically, I think U.S. labor has not been well served uh, by being forced, in a way, uh, by legislation to divert a large part of the income into pension funds, which have been the single largest source of money for these asset managers and for private equity and for hedge funds. Had uh, the US stayed with a pay-as-you-go pension system, financialization around the entire globe, <laughs> to put it bluntly, would have looked differently. Because you know, if you look who are the largest real estate, institutional real estate owners in any major European city, 
you will usually find private equity funds who manage the money of US pension funds. Uh, simply put, there are also Canadian pension funds and Scandinavian pension funds and so on, but the elephant in the room but that is as large as all the other pension sectors combined is always the US. So this is the macro picture. Okay. Thank you. Um, Thank you very much. Does BlackRock have something to say about it? Yeah, yeah of course. Uh, <laughs> uh, I mean, the main purpose of our company is is um, the purpose to to democratize the access to assets. Now it's obvious that everybody can have assets, and that's something that everybody should have. For instance, we have a huge crisis in demography, uh, demography in Western countries, but also in Asia, in China, in India. Demography is worse and worse. So it means that the pay as you go system counts like it's doomed to them to deficit. Even in France, we have a deficit of 10 billion euro for uh, the pay as you go system. So we have to think about our future, our pension system, and the main. The main way you can do this is by investing yourself and to prepare your future by yourself. Okay, thank you very much. Yeah. Okay, so um, do we have questions from the audience regarding the financialization and the role of pension funds and the political consequences of all of this for our regulator? Yes, please. It's at least for me, it's hard to think about that real tension between like the worker and uh, them feeling as asset owners in the sense of, but like, yeah, you know, you have pension funds, but actually you're not trading. And like, I mean, it's money you put aside and it, that's done for you. Uh, <coughs> So, in the end, you, I mean, it, it ends up being the same big players who discuss between each other in the sense of pension funds and other funds, uh, other yeah, asset managers or whatever. So, <coughs> yeah, basically the question is that, do you actually believe that pension, like the standalone person, like the, yeah, the, the, the people, Perceive, mm -hmm. perceive themselves as uh, their own asset managers and their own uh, or as, yeah, proprietor of uh, new ways of mm -hmm. assets. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I think actually the question should be to the uh, to the average uh, <laughs> the average uh, investor. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Should be to the average investor. This, um, this applies to a very specific part of the world. So we're talking about like the wealthiest part of the world where uh, the formal market is large enough to have a notch amount of workers with enough money to actually start investing. You take a country like Peru where 80% of the labor market is informal and this discussion is just pointless. Or you take a country like Uruguay where half my rent will come from pension funds, but pension funds are so small and insignificant that it's not even really a thing you think about. Like, okay, am I like pushing the pension fund to invest in this or that? And is it really like benefiting me? So this is just really like a very American, Western European recently because of some reform, for example, in Germany uh, discussion. And when it comes to that, um, what ends up happening is that depending on and also like, okay, and then you also have to take out of this middle class only the portion <coughs> that it's like big enough to actually own assets because you will have a lot of people unemployed or in poverty that will not be accessing this. So uh, is this portion of the population large enough for uh, there to be some tensions with the governments in the sense that they are actually like voting and they have a vote big enough to say, hey, you want, I need you to represent us and I need you to like push for a laxer regulation so that we can like, some authors say yes and some authors say no. It's like really like uh, some attribute the financial crisis as this. So some actually are saying it's not that the 
um, financial uh, sector was actually pushing for these regulations and that made the economy be more unstable and fragile and therefore there was a crisis, but it's actually that the financial sector saw that the voters were pushing for these kind of regulations and they just let it happen and they benefit from it. So that's one view. Mm -hmm. And there are others who say that you know, they actually like really push. So it's not a clear answer for now. It's very recent too, like too early to call, I would I'm say. Sorry for interrupting, but we're going a bit long and we still have two very interesting topics. Um, so I'm going to try to stay as brief as possible here with my part on this. But we basically uh, want to talk about uh, the revolving door and political influence of big asset managers. And also I'm um, commenting on the point of the paper that uh, the political um, uh, prominence of the company is more of a liability um, than actually an advantage. And it's not like, it's uh, more portrayed in the paper as like a consequence of the success and maybe not as like also a way of it, uh, how they achieve the success by being able to influence um, regulation and having insider information because of their political connections. Like for example, Friedrich Merz in Germany or some uh, things with the energy privatization in Mexico or our representative here from Paris, France, um, who was part of creating the pension reform in Free, which actually sparked huge protests and then after privatizing the French pension system uh, used all his network and went to Black Block, Black Block <laughs> sorry, no, I'm speaking, in 2015. So um, what is your response to this? Uh? I mean, you, you made a great job <laughs> as a journalist. Uh, uh, first, revolving door. So, so you, you're, ma you're making a serious claim about me. Like you, the revolving door, the same, the definition is when you come from private and then you go to public and then you come back to private. Uh, there's this movement from and in and outside. I come from public state, of course, but then I, I went to, to private company and I didn't come back ever. The, the main thing I say, I, I, I understand, I understood that the, the, the system, the corporate ways of dealing with pensions was super <coughs> slow and I didn't privatize at all the, 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 the pension system in France. Uh, I mean, you're in France and you're still uh, uh, perhaps aware that we still have a public pension system. But yes, I, I do believe that we have to work together. The main issue we had in order to mitigate the different crises we had is the lack of competencies from state and also businesses. I'm not, I'm not saying claiming that business are the, the best things, but we have to work together. And as a former worker into the state system, state government, I think I can bring a lot of competencies into businesses. And that's what we need. Thank you very much. Um, what would our regulator say on this topic of the revolving door between asset managers and uh, public offices in Europe and the US? <laughs> well, uh, I have to remember that I'm the regulator, I guess. Uh, as you may have read in the newspaper uh, this week, uh, the Ombudsman of the European Commission has just uh, successfully forced us, the European Commission, to um, end the practice of allowing up to 12 years of leave from the Commission uh, for people to go to the private sector and then come back because we have held their positions open for them for 12 years. So uh, we're doing everything we can uh, to, uh, to, end, to end this. Thank you very much. Do we have questions on this topic? Uh, yes, Christina, please. Mm, I'm wondering what, uh, in terms of regulations, BlackRock is afraid of. So, is it um, more like in terms of um, regulation of the rules on the market, or is it some kind of like taxation? Or, yeah, I'm just I'm just kind of trying to make out the picture of uh, what uh, could be the danger uh, for BlackRock mm. from the regulatory side. Is a question to Blackrock or to the regulator? Yeah, I think it's a question to you. We're maybe like exiting the role game a bit, but I think it, your perspective is probably very interesting. Uh, well, I can only guess because I'm the regulator. Um, and uh, it really, I would say, yeah, uh, in, in, if I'm the US regulator, uh, then it's clear that probably Blackrock seems 
scared uh, of regulation that would uh, aim at, you know, the, it goes in the direction of not allowing asset managers or any institutional investor to have, for example, large investments in the same, in companies in the same sector. Um, and they can only hold one airline or one bank out of the five large airlines or five large banks. Uh, that's one option. Uh, and that would be, you know, I mean, that would explode their index fund business. They, they would, because all these airlines are in the index and all these banks are in the index. Uh, or uh, regulation that would force them, and that's what I showed you, this uh, index act introduced by some Republican senators uh, recently that would force um, asset managers to vote each and every share they hold in accordance um, with the preferences of each and every beneficial owner of these shares. So the pension funds or the individual investors, which you know can be hundreds of thousands, millions even, maybe. Um, and so you can, of course, imagine a technological solution to this, but, but this also would vastly increase the costs uh, the, the entire index business is based on being extremely cheap, um, and uh, it's a low margin business. You know, they're not making it's, it's cheap. It's good for you investors, uh, but uh, I think they're they would be scared of this type of regulation that would basically, I mean, it yeah, would also cause problems because it's good that this is cheap, but um, it's bad that so much power is concentrated in so few hands as a result. Thank you very, very much. So we will continue with our fourth topic. Yeah. All right, for the last topic, uh, we want to address the ecological transition and the relationship with asset manager capitalism. Um, basically, what we have seen so far is that some authors like uh, Condon, for example, pose that it's like these big universal diversified managers that have the key to actually push transformation, but at the same time, the same company like BlackRock will uh, vote no uh, to like uh, to green investments in the US while voting yes in Europe. So how do you manage that? And the first version of the paper that was addressed as organizational hypocrisy. So what we want to do now is basically open the room for questions from the people. and. Uh, and on the topic of like the ecological transition and like the role with like this type of uh, asset manager capitalism, basically. Thank you. So, okay. So, your name? Yeah, Sophia. Okay. The questions can be addressed to BlackRock or to the yeah. leader, by the way. So, I think as an average citizen who is willing to invest, because BlackRock is telling me it might be beneficial for me. But I'm also concerned about the green transition. I would like to ask, in this case, the EU representative, what can actually policymakers do uh, in order to prevent greenwashing or washing? Thinking about fund leveling or, I don't know, favorite tax systems. What do you think would be useful for me as a potential investor to go in the right direction? Maybe we can take like a few questions to. Mm -hmm. yeah. uh, yeah, uh, in the back. Um, I, uh, I realize that you mentioned that Nile Gabor's uh, Wall Street consensus. And uh, so this question maybe gets out a bit of this role play, because it would be more to you as Benjamin Brown and not as the EU regulator. Maybe. But I would be very interested if you could um, relate to the ecological transition with the Wall Street consensus of private finance being pushed as a way to finance um, green investments. Uh, kind of also taking over the role that prior developmental state had, right, in, in forging these long term, well, now it's not long term anymore, right, but in investing in, in, um, in the ecological transition, especially in poorer countries. And if you could maybe elaborate a bit more on the role of asset manager capitalism in this respect mm -hmm. and asset management. Okay, uh, Felix goes first. Uh, yeah, I'm wondering, we know that carbon-intensive industry Felix. Felix. Okay. Felix. Carbon industries and businesses are highly overrepresented at the asset market. And I'm wondering if the 
increasing participation of middle class and other people investing their income and their life savings in these industries um, is not sort of uh, locking in a political economy that makes people dependent on these carbon intensive industries. So uh, reducing our chances to enact policy that could seriously challenge these business models. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Sure. I think we do three and, and then, then we have more time to go again. We, we're going to take these three questions and then we'll be like, go a bit farther down. Okay, mm -hmm. thank you. These are all really good questions and not easy ones. Um, and they all go in the same direction, of course. Um, so let me try to uh, give a short answer. I would say that uh, it's extremely difficult uh, for uh, uh, both me as a regulator and me as a, a student of, uh, of this stuff to come up with good ideas um, for how to make it so that uh, the existing financial sector uh, ch channels money from beneficial owners, from uh, household investors with you know, green preferences who would like to make their money work for the green transition. Um, <laughs> that is not at all easy because, as uh, you said in the last question, the economy uh, is what it is at the moment, and uh, the most product, the most sorry, the most uh, profitable investments are not always uh, um, the greenest, or rather, so far the opposite. Now, increasingly, we're getting into. Um, this is sometimes the case. Um, so a taxonomy, for example, uh, that is very stringent and that you know, just regulates where specific types of investors uh, can invest um, and cannot invest, for example, uh, that would be the most straightforward way of doing this. As, so a taxonomy that is a public taxonomy where Commission, for example, defines uh, clean, green and dirty sectors. Uh, and then you could, for example, uh, I mean, this could then be either voluntary or uh, not voluntary. But if it was voluntary, you could still then buy funds that adhere to that taxonomy. And uh, you could you know, sleep calmly uh, while your money works for the green transition. Um, but structurally, this is much more complicated. This relates uh, to the last question also, because you know, if you just have your savings that you don't need for anything else, then you may be willing to sacrifice some returns, even if it's green, because you don't depend on these returns. And that's one thing. But um, generally, we're speaking about pension funds that have liabilities to uh, future retirees and these future retirees income you know the, the question of whether they will be uh, fine in old age or whether they will be poor in old age like uh, depends on getting as much uh, out of these returns maybe in the next 10 years as possible and so structurally uh, this is much more difficult uh, you can see the difficulty uh, with engineering uh, this correctly uh, much better if you take a macro perspective as opposed to just the individual saver um, and and yeah from this perspective it also becomes clearer I think maybe to the second question why the de-risking state is so attractive to policymakers because basically the state can come in and subsidize investments that it, uh, <coughs> Given the existing economy, there are certain green investments that are more or less green, uh, that are not profitable in a way that would secure the returns that pension funds need for savers to be fine, for pensioners to be fine. But the state can subsidize these investments, use the public balance sheet in order to basically patch over uh, this problem. Um, but yeah, it may not be the most, you know, it, it's a patch. It's, it's not the most efficient way, I think, if the goal was really to maximize the speed of the low carbon transition. It's a very roundabout way of doing that, I think, compared to just straightforward public investment. Thank you very much. Okay, so we're pretty much at the end, but if it's okay, we're going to do another last round of questions and be like a couple of minutes long. So please, questions. 
Yes, uh, yes Christina. Mm. I'm, I'm thinking because you are saying that the uh, like black corporate in general, these index funds are a way, kind of a safe bet in participating in the growth of mm -hmm. the economy. Mm -hmm. So um, my question is, even if they are able to help with the uh, part of ecological transition, which uh, corresponds to like technological change and decoupling, they will never be uh, able to like help with the deep eco ecological transition from the perspective of like the Earth or even like a steady yes. state mm -hmm. economics perspective. Mm -hmm. um, and yeah, what, what's your like takeaway on that? We have a second question. Yes, Okay, so I do have a, sorry. Um, so my question is on the, on, on the role of BlackRock and other institutions and investors, are they legally liable to the shareholder maximiza maximization theory? Because if we suppose that they will disinvest from coal and gas and oil right now with returns being high, they may be sued as, as, as a result by some shareholders. And also the second uh, part of my question is even green financial activism an efficient way to decarbonize because uh, last month I think the economist wrote an article about some funds whose official banner is to fight climate change mm -hmm. but they are at the same time pressuring uh, management to maximize the, the returns. So can they publicly say we want to decarbonize but pr pr privately they are also pressuring the maximization of returns. For last one, I saw Cleo in the back. Uh, yeah, I'm kind of interested in this, this study of risk. Cleo, Cleo and Andra. Um, yeah, because I'm, I guess the way I see it is that there's a lot of like networking and there's a lot of interconnection between all of this, but I guess aren't all of these institutional investors and data managers kind of exposing themselves to some form of systemic risk if they're all investing in the same companies? Uh, on a sector level, if there's risk for that sector, then doesn't that expose the whole system to systemic risk? So is this, could this be a cause of another sort of economic crash that we had in 2008? Is this a, a worry of people who say this? Um, yeah, maybe I'll start with this last question. Um, I mean, traditionally the idea is that the uh, maximum uh, Diversification of a financial portfolio affords the best, the lowest risk given, uh, uh, the best risk return profile, if you will, or the, the, lo the lowest risk. Um, now, they are invested in all sectors, really, these biggest ones. And I think if we think about uh, systemic change, then that arise, uh, systemic risk, then it arises from two uh, sources. One is that a lot of trading just happens through these asset managers. And there was an episode in the UK uh, where the Bank of England just intervened this week because of some stuff related to pension funds, liability-driven investment, where BlackRock and other asset managers basically shut this down uh, because, yeah, well, uh, of uh, collateral problems uh, in this market. And so this risk would have uh, materialized even without BlackRock, given this liability-driven investment strategy, but uh, the asset managers are the actors that decided to call the Bank of England and to stop, basically, to basically freeze uh, the trading for these uh, pension funds. So the other uh, aspect is that these asset managers just embrace certain types of corporate governance activities and uh, views and practices and uh, they do that because it's you know practical, cheap maybe, uh, au automatable, and so they uh, collect certain types of information and they process them in a certain way, and they do that all in the same way more or less, and uh, across all their investments. And so that is, I think, another source of systemic risk, which is just overlooking problems uh, or even pushing companies towards unsustainable practices, which. Then we're back uh, with the with the um, with the climate issue. Uh, are they liable in the U.S.? Um, this is a I cannot answer this question because it's usually complicated uh, and it's a battle, an ongoing battle in the U.S. I think, where you know uh, basically 
the conservative side is trying to argue, yes, they, they must maximize shareholder value. They cannot diverge. Because at the moment, this still would, it on average, means that they need to, um, cannot divest from fossil fuels, must develop, uh, you know, fossil assets where they are profit, where that's profitable. Whereas progressives uh, use the legal system to, and uh, uh, the work of my friend Madison Condon, for example, is, is going in that direction. You use legal arguments to make the case that no, they are actually empowered already under existing law to uh, um, take uh, climate related issues into account when they decide how to invest and how to engage on their investors' behalf, even if that retur uh, lowers returns you know, next year, for example. And about the question of degrowth, which is absolutely, I think, fundamental, and the, the simple uh, answer is that that is the biggest, I think, uh, uh, problem, is that uh, any private-led uh, low-carbon transition can only deliver through green growth. You know, uh, we must fully believe in green growth, uh, in the possibility of green growth, if uh, that's our model. Whereas um, degrowth obviously cannot be administered by these, uh, by these, or at least uh, uh, they will not actively bring it about because they have to make returns, and degrowth have to means negative returns. Degrowth means uh, de redistribution uh, in order to. Uh, limit the fallout from falling returns uh, because some people can afford falling returns and the vast majority cannot afford this, so we need redistribution. But you know, BlackRock is a big entity, but uh, <laughs> <laughs> they cannot redistribute. Only the state can redistribute. So I, uh, I think that's the, a key issue there that you can always bring up in, in, in an argument on this. Thank you very much. Yes. <laughs> Thank you. Especially to Professor Brown, who like you know, accepted our weird. weird proposal. Uh, well, I didn't even uh, know this was weird. This I thought this is how you do stuff, but I think it. Uh, <laughs> I think it, it worked uh, brilliantly, and uh, thanks very much for uh, for your engagement. Yes. Thank you. <laughs> I worry a little bit about on, Mathieu, Mathieu that would then consider much more comfort, comfortable to be on the right side. <laughs> <laughs> okay, we, we, we start again at 4.30 sharp, yes? Uh, so this is meant to be a protest. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so this is also part of the performance of, the, uh -huh. of this presentation. <laughs> to clarify, it's not a protest against anyone in this room, <laughs> of course. Uh, but several structural comments that can be made only through a protest. The first is the clear lack of organization that often happens through movements that don't exist within the structure, and therefore how the voice of um, the, out the, the systems on the outside or the people on the outside is completely neglected. And so three perspectives on that. The first is obviously the developing world colonial perspective and how um, this kind of model, this kind of asset management, is a complete replication of neoliberalist, uh, neoliberalist of course, but colonial perspectives where significant, where companies uh, that come from specific countries that have already created structures are able to gain power again. And we see this in the way BlackRock talks, right? So specifically three points. The first is that they're saying, uh, the, fir the, the way we argue with BlackRock is that is by saying that yeah, the ecological transition is not happening, the social transition is not happening because BlackRock is not uh, voting in the right ways. Um, but this is ridiculous. We've, we've said that yes, you have the power to vote, to not vote, to have this control over the economy, which is absolutely ridiculous. This kind of, the existence of this kind of power, the, the acceptance that regulators have participated in, that yeah, this power does exist, um, is basically us saying that colonial perspectives will continue on. BlackRock then continues to tell us that they want a strategy for long-term resilient investment, which means that it's so clear that they want for growth to continue into the next 20 years. Um, which is, again, <laughs> right, a great example of why protests sometimes don't work, because <laughs> it's not possible to talk to the power. Uh, okay, the second perspective is, of course, the feminist one, 
Uh, I think this panel was great. We most of the questions came from women, but asset management, all these other companies, obviously, are not represented by the female, like by women at all. Um, and again, there's a concentration of power. And finally, the third one is ecological transition, which all obviously has been pointed out before. But again, there's an acceptance even from regulators that the only way for the ecological transition to happen in the first place is for it to be green growth, which is ridiculous. Like it's uninspired. As like as protesters, <laughs> that's what we're saying. Okay. <laughs>